let's get started. Uh, I'm just uh, introducing the next speaker. It's uh, Puneet Nefertali talking about smooth analysis for uh, low rank solutions to SDP. Thank you all for coming to the talk. Uh, this is joint work with Srinath Bhojanapalli, Nikola Bumal, and Pratik Jain. So, as the title indicates, we are interested in solving semi definite programs. Uh, these are problems where we wish to minimize a linear function, c times x, subject to linear constraints, ai x equal to bi, uh, but with additional constraint that x has to be positive semi definite, meaning that x is a symmetric matrix and uh, all its eigenvalues are non negative. Okay? And uh, it has several applications. I perhaps don't need to stress on these uh, to this audience. And uh, there also exist polynomial time solutions uh, for solving semi definite programs. And uh, examples include ellipsoid method, interior point method, multiplicative weight update, and so on. Okay. Uh, even though these are polynomial time methods, uh, they have problems scaling to extremely large uh, problem sizes uh, when you try to solve them in practice. And in order to uh, uh, cope up with this issue, Bureau and Montero in 2003 proposed uh, a new approach to solving these programs, uh, solving these problems. Uh, and they demonstrated that these, uh, their approach is actually empirically uh, very good. It performs very well on a large class of problems. And they also provide a lot of interesting, uh, they also show a lot of interesting results about their approach. Uh, but they, uh, <coughs> Uh, they uh, do not manage to show a general proof of correctness on general semi-definite programs. Okay? Uh, I'll come back to explaining what exactly the Bureau Monitor approach is in just a minute. But uh, the basic uh, building block uh, that starts out the Bureau Monitor approach is this uh, uh, older result by Barvinok and by Pataki, which basically says that for any feasible semi-definite program, uh, with m constraints, so m here stands for the number of constraints. As long as it is feasible, there exists at least one solution whose rank is at most square root of m. Okay, so if the number of constraints is m, then there exists at least one solution <laughs> whose rank is only square root of m. And in several practical applications, m, the number of constraints, is the same as the ambient dimension n. And this means that you actually have solutions whose rank is square root n. So in general, there, a priori, there is no reason to expect that there can even be a solution of rank n minus 1. But it turns out that as long as you have only n constraints, you have a solution of rank only square root of n. Okay? <coughs> now, what are the advantages of these low rank solutions? So the first one is that uh, once you have the solution, you only have to use n to the 1.5 space to actually store the solution rather than n square. So it reduces the memory requirement. And on the other, uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, whenever these SDPs actually come up as relaxations of combinatorially hard problems, whenever you can find low rank solutions, the rounding procedure actually has better guarantees depending on the rank of the solution that you find. Okay, so these are the two main advantages. And the Bureau Montero approach actually gives us a uh, tries to find a third advantage, which is that they want to use the existence of these low rank solutions to actually find them faster. Uh, to actually solve this optimization problem faster. And what is this approach? So the problem on the left is the original semi-definite program where we wish to minimize Cx subject to these constraints. Uh, the main idea behind this uh, bureau monitor approach is to write x as u u transpose, where u is factorized only by a n cross k matrix. Okay? Uh, and k is usually, as I mentioned, much, much smaller than n. And once we replace x to be u u transpose, it has two uh, it basically enforces two things. One is that x is automatically positive semi-definite because we are writing it in the square form. And the second one is because u is a tall matrix, x is automatically a low rank matrix. Okay. So the modified problem that we wish to solve is to minimize c times u u transpose subject to ai u u transpose equal to bi. Okay. This is the uh, constraint problem that the Bureau monitor approach tries to solve. Now, uh, this is still a constraint problem, and one of the ways to try uh, solve a constraint problem is to first turn it an, into an unconstrained problem and solve the unconstrained problem. And one of the basic ways of doing this transformation is to write the uh, penalized version, where we have the objective, which is C times UU transpose, and then we have a penalty parameter, which is mu, and then we add a quadratic penalty, which is 
a i u u transpose minus b i this basically tells us how much we are so uh, we are not satisfying a particular constraint and we put a square and then mu basically penalizes gives a, tells us how much to penalize each unsatisfied constraint okay and now we have uh, converted this into an unconstrained problem we can try to solve this uh, i should point out here uh, that the a penalty version is not the best way to convert a constrained problem to an unconstrained problem and there are more sophisticated ways of doing this but for the purposes of this talk i'll just focus on the penalized version and towards the end of this talk i'll say a bit more about more sophisticated methods like augmented lagrangian and so on okay uh, so how do we solve this penalty problem a uh, penalized version of the problem so the main challenge is that uh, even though f originally is convex in the uh, x space so the penalty version the x space is convex uh, it turns out that this uu transpose factorization makes this non convex so the uh, question is how do we solve this non convex problem and in general solving non convex problems is uh, np hard and we cannot hope to do it uh, but uh, for non convex problems uh, we can actually uh, solve for what are known as stationary points and let me introduce what stationary points are so first order stationary points are just those points where the gradient is small okay and second order stationary points are those where the gradient is small and hessian is almost positive some of them okay uh, this is the second thing here uh, we can actually find second order stationary points very efficiently and there actually has been a lot of recent work in uh, making finding the second order uh, stationary points uh, very very efficiently using just gradient descent and first order algorithms okay Yeah. Why do you make the on on the second order condition? Why don't you say greater or equal to zero? Why don't you allow, why do you allow it to be a little bit negative? Uh, because in fact, uh, we we can <coughs> just just because like we cannot solve anything exactly right, so we cannot get a gradient equal to zero. Yeah, but and like similarly, inequality, right? Greater or equal to, but you allow it to be a little negative. You could allow it to because it's hard to distinguish whether uh, there is an extremely small eigenvalue or not. You could just say greater or equal to zero, right? I'm just wondering. In general, like uh, iterative methods cannot get you exactly equal yes, to. Yes, yes. So you say you you can ask for greater or equal to zero. <laughs> what do we ask? There you can, but he's asking for less. Greater or equal to minus. So this is yeah. what. <laughs> so I'm just wondering whether it's going to be a trick in your analysis. No, right? it's not a trick in my analysis. So uh, all we really need is this, and uh, this is what people have looked at. But I guess if you use second order methods where you exactly query the Hessian, then you can exactly check whether it's uh, greater than. Uh, Because you you are doing it by by representing the matrix as U U transpose, right? Yeah. That's how you force it to be that way. And uh, never never mind, never mind. It's okay. We can talk about that. I'm sorry. Sure. Oh. Yes. Uh, okay. So the point that I want to make in the slide is that for non-convex optimization problems, it is indeed possible to find second-order stationary points efficiently, and we can use those algorithms on this problem. So we will find a second-order stationary point of this optimization problem. so what can we say about the second order stationary points uh in a recent work bumal et al actually show that once k is greater than or equal to the square root 2m which is the same as the existential result that i mentioned earlier for almost all c so c is the objective uh, here so c is the objective in the semi definite program for almost all c every second order stationary point is actually a global optimum for this optimization problem okay are there conditions on mu there is no uh, for every mu so you pick c at random okay with probability 1 yeah. for every mu every second order stationary point is a global optimum yeah is there an epsilon that modifies second order stationary <coughs> point uh the previous slide you had epsilon floating around yeah okay so this statement is for exact second order stationary points where you put epsilon equal to 0 great so these are approximate definitions of uh, first order and second order stationary points and this is precisely one of the questions that we want to ask so this result basically says that exact second order stationary points are exact global optima but in practice you cannot find exact second order stationary points or first order stationary points what so for almost all c mean that you can quantify that uh okay so for the purposes of this talk you can think of uh, where so bad c have lebesgue measure 0 That's what it means. Oh, uh, what? I'm sorry. Could you what? Bad? The bad. Okay, so a bad C will be that it has some second-order stationary point which is not a global optimum. Yeah. Then the set of all such C has Lebesgue measure zero. Okay. 
Under what measure? Under what? what Lebeg, measure? Lebeg measure. Well, okay. Um, the bad, the bad C. So line. bad C, bad C lies in uh, n cross n space, right? Does that also hold in final precision computation? When you compute the thing. Uh, this is just an existential statement. There is no computation involved here. Oh, I see. I'm not sure. I won't have an icon. Okay. Yeah. So this result basically says that, uh, yeah, almost all is that with uh, the C that does not satisfy this property has Lebesgue measure zero. Okay. Uh, so this leads to two open questions. So the first question is whether there exists bad C in this Lebesgue measure zero set for which second order stationary point, like uh, there is a second order stationary point which is not a global optimum, right? Is this almost all, is it really necessary or is it just that it's a proof artifact? Okay, so that's the first question. And the second question is uh, precisely the computational question that we want to raise, which is that in practice, we cannot find exact second order stationary points. We can only find approximate second order stationary points. So uh, does this statement also hold for approximate versions, meaning that our approximate second order stationary points approximate global optima? Okay. So these are the two questions that uh, uh, this result gives rise to. And we answer both of these questions affirmatively. Uh, first, we show that uh, we can construct C for which there are bad second order stationary points, which are actually not global optimum. So this almost all is actually required. And second, for perturbed SDPs, I mean, because this almost all is required, you have to add some amount of perturbation for any given problem. But once you add some amount of perturbation, approximate second order stationary points are approximate global optimum. Okay. And I'll only be talking about this second result. And let me now try to elaborate more on what exactly I mean by this perturbed and approximate and so on. Okay. Okay. So uh, we, when we say perturbation, we basically mean it in the smooth analysis sense, meaning that we take the uh, objective C and then we add a random Gaussian perturbation G. So G is a symmetric Gaussian matrix with uh, covariance sigma G square and the standard deviation is epsilon. So epsilon is this parameter. And we look at the problem uh, which is C plus G. Uh, so the penalized problem exactly the same except that C is replaced by C plus G. So this is a new penalized problem. <laughs> And the rank that you want to get is square root of m log 1 over epsilon. So you are optimizing in this low rank space. And once you do this, then we can show that with high probability, every epsilon second order stationary point is actually an epsilon global optimum. That epsilon is not related to your... It's the same epsilon that I mentioned. So this epsilon second order stationary point means that the gradient is less than or equal to epsilon. And the Hessian is... Uh, yes, the, the second order condition is, is hardwired into your analysis there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you give me greater than or equal to zero, then it doesn't hurt me. Uh, but we don't really need it. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's an epsilon global optimum of the perturbed objective or of the original objective? Of the perturbed objective. Can you connect the two? Sorry? Can you connect the perturbed objective to the original objective? Is that yeah, so uh, it would depend on like uh, the sizes of AI, BI and so on that when you, because you are just changing the objective by a little bit. So as long as uh, other things are bounded, you, you should be able to connect them. I thought you were going to do that. You were going to show that, you know, that, that optimum. So I mean, you, you could do that on top of this, but uh, like this is what we currently show. Uh, but if you're really interested in solving the original problem, you can again try to connect both of them. Uh, we haven't done that work. So how is this high probability dependent on epsilon? Uh, this high probability does not depend on epsilon. So the epsilons are already connected here. So, so we'll give an expression for the probability. It's in yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What needs to go? So the omega, so whatever constants you have here would come in this high probability. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's with constant probability or the. Pro no, I'm saying like whatever probability you want here, that would modify a constant that you would put in this omega. Okay. This is shown because of the Gaussian, right? Because of the Gaussian matrix, that's the only probabilistic thing that you have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 
in terms of uh, runtime guarantees that we get for this problem so we use capital z to denote the total number of non zeros in the problem okay uh, interior point methods have only a logarithmic dependence on uh, 1 over epsilon which is the desired accuracy and then a polynomial dependence on all of these uh, other uh, problem dependent parameters and multiplicative weights uh, has 1 over epsilon square dependence on epsilon uh, and does not explicitly have dependencies on the dimension and so on but it depends on something called the width parameter which one has to compute on a problem to problem basis uh, to evaluate the runtime complexity and finally uh, our result so i should mention that this quantity is to solve the penalized problem and you need to do more work to uh, as i mentioned like the penalized version is probably not the best way to solve the constraint problem as such uh, but the result that we are giving here is only for solving the penalized problem okay and uh, this depends as z square root m plus m to the 3 over to n uh, times poly of mu, mu over epsilon what algorithm is this Sorry? What algorithm is... What algorithm oh, okay, so this is, you could just do uh, put up gradient descent on the gradient, yeah, you just apply accelerated gradient descent or gradient descent, you get this guarantee, yeah. Okay, so uh, in the remaining part of the talk, let me just briefly present the main ideas of the proof. So uh, there are two key steps uh, which have already been established in prior work to understanding, uh, to tackling this problem. The first, step, uh, the first step tries to so the first step tries to establish that any second order stationary point which is rank deficient which is not full rank is a global optimum okay what this means is that if u is a second order stationary point and if rank of u is strictly smaller than k so less than or equal to k minus 1 then u is a global optimum uh, this was already uh, shown in Burer Montero's original paper okay and the second key step is that for f that comes from perturbed SDPs, uh, where perturbed again we add this random Gaussian perturbation with probability 1 if k is greater than or equal to square root m then all first order stationary points are rank deficient. So why does this suffice? Basically we find a second order stationary point, it's also a first order stationary point and so this is rank deficient and if it is rank deficient we know that it's a global optimum. So that's the main idea. Uh, so as I mentioned, like all of these have been done for exact SOSPs and exact FOSPs. So our main contribution to basically make this all quantitative and make sure that the quantitative dependence is not exponential in anything and it's polynomial in all the relevant parameters. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me now uh, first uh, tell you how to do the second part, which is that uh, all approximate first order stationary points are approximately rank deficient. So if we write down the function that we wish to optimize, so it has this ugly expression and when we write down first order stationary point, we know that the gradient is actually small, right? That's what the definition of first order stationary point is. The most important thing to note about the gradient is that it can actually be written as a product of two matrices. So the first matrix is this complicated expression and the second matrix is just U which is the thing that we are trying to optimize for, right? And uh, the most important thing to note here is that the product of two matrices can be small only if at least one of them is rank deficient. If both of them are full rank, then the product has to be non-zero. Excuse me, what's the, the dimension of the AI? The uh, N cross N. Hmm? N cross N. So this whole thing is an N cross N matrix. This is an n cross k matrix and if you have a product of two matrices which is small then at least one of them have to be rank deficient. Both of them cannot be full rank and the product becomes small. Okay. So then all we need to really establish is that this left matrix is actually full rank then it automatically turns out that this right matrix is actually low rank. Okay. So you only have to establish that this left matrix is actually uh, has rank greater than or equal to n minus k. Okay, so now uh, you see that this left matrix has this Gaussian plus a bunch of other things. So for simplicity, let's just consider what the rank of a Gaussian, random Gaussian matrix is, right? Uh, the smallest singular values of Gaussian matrix, matrices have been uh, extremely well studied in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, or 15 years or so. And uh, the probability that a random Gaussian matrix is singular is actually equal to zero. So with probability one, it's not singular. And in general, the n minus ith 
smallest singular value of g uh, goes as i over square root n. So if you look at the smallest k and then take the sum of squares of them, it grows as k cube over n. Okay, this is the expected behavior of the sum of squares of the smallest singular values of a random Gaussian matrix. Yeah. So can you elaborate a little more on that, that you said product of two matrices? So I can scale an identity by epsilon and image full rank for arbitrary small epsilon. Yeah, by uh, full rank I mean, okay, so you have to do some scaling here, meaning that as long as uh, this is uh, non-zero and this is non-zero. Oh, what is non-zero? The matrix is non-zero. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm I saying with the, the relative scale. scale. So if the you scale, of all ones is not zero, but it's, it's highly rank efficient. Okay. So the precise statement that I want to make is that if you normalize two matrices and then take their product, if it is small, it means that one of them has to be relatively rank efficient. Uh, is that right? They could be orthogonal to each other. Or they because one of them because is square. They have full rank, so they cannot be orthogonal because this spans the entire space and the other one also spans the entire space. So they cannot be orthogonal. Your second matrix is n by k. What do you mean the entire space? I mean, the full rank means that it has rank k. So if this n cross n matrix spans the entire space, that also contains this k dimensional subspace here. That's why. Okay. So the expected behavior of the sum of squares of the smallest k singular values is k cube over n, okay? And it is indeed actually possible to obtain large deviation bounds for this random quantity uh, that it's actually smaller than some small constant times its expected behavior. And the uh, uh, failure probability goes exponentially as minus k square, okay? So this is the property that we want to use for random Gaussian matrices. And uh, this can actually be extended for any uh, Arbitrary matrix plus a Gaussian matrix. You don't, so, yeah. So, do you want the sum of singular value squared or just, I, I thought you were going to deal with the operator now, right? Generally? Uh, no, so we want to show that the smallest singular values of this matrix are large. Sure. Uh, which would then mean, so that's why I'm looking at the sum of squares of the smallest singular values. But just the smallest, I see k is small. I mean, k is small, k is small. And you know, the like matrix, square root n. The matrix A can be doesn't have to be positive semi-definite. No, I mean we are only looking at uh, singular values. So right, but G plus A. I mean, if I can give you any A, I can make the, the singular values. Are we but G is random. G does not know A. Uh, so G is picked randomly. So A is fixed, and then you are picking G at random. So the randomness cannot really off. Uh, So this basically says that you can actually get the same bound for any G plus, uh, for a matrix G plus A, where A was arbitrarily picked and G was independently cho chosen after A, okay? Now, uh, in the current context, we are interested in bonding this G plus, this whole quantity. And the bad aspect here is that this quantity, this matrix that we have here depends on U. And U is an unknown for us because U could be any second order stationary point and a priori we don't know what exactly these matrices can be. And the way we deal with this is to first actually do an epsilon net over the m dimensional space. And then within this epsilon net, you look at matrices of the form C plus lambda i AI. Okay. For each of these points in the epsilon net, you can actually get this uh, 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 concentration, high de uh, large deviation bound. And if you do a union bound and then use smoothness to extend to the entire ball, you basically uh, can get the result. And the union bound over this epsilon net is precisely, uh, will precisely give you this one over epsilon to the m factor because you're doing union bound over m things. And you want this minus k square to actually cancel this one over epsilon to the m. So that's basically where you get k square greater than or equal to m log one over epsilon. You have to do an epsilon net in m space, you can't do it in k space somehow? You can't do it in k space because uh, like this matrix, is, like this whole matrix lies in the subspace of, sub sure. subspace spanned by AI which is actually an m-dimensional space, so we cannot. Okay. Okay, so uh, there are some technical issues to uh, carry this out actually. Uh, the first thing is that you cannot do an epsilon net over like entire RM. You can only do on a compact like ball or something like that. And in this context, what it means is that these coefficients that you have here, 
you need to actually show that they're they, they don't go to infinity they cannot be arbitrarily large they're all bounded and uh, you can actually show that uh, for compact sdps uh, all second order stationary points are uniformly bounded which means that u is actually bounded which means that this whole quantity is again bounded and so doing a union bound <coughs> over a compact ball is already good enough for the for for our purpose okay uh, uh, this seems kind of quite obvious that uh, for compact sdps meaning that if the feasible set is compact all second order stationary points are also uniformly bounded but uh, technically it turns out that this is uh, one of the challenging aspects in showing it okay okay so now let me come to the other part which is to show that once we have these approximately low rank second order stationary points they are actually approximately global optima uh, the main idea here is that because f is convex in the original space before you did the factorization uh, if a matrix u u transpose is suboptimal there exists a descent direction because f is convex in the original space okay and uh, in fact you can show that there exists a descent direction which increases the rank by only one and now this makes it clear why you uh, you being rank deficient is good because you can actually like this uh, descent direction which increases the rank by at most one also exists in this factorized space because u was rank deficient okay uh, similarly if u is actually approximately rank deficient you can actually massage the uh, descent direction which, which uh, rank one descent direction to also exist in this factorized space and then construct a descent direction which does not really increase the rank so it exists in the factorized space uh, whenever u, u is very suboptimal so approximately rank deficient means u has a small singular value and then your direction is the is the sing is a singular vector corresponding to that small singular value yeah we use that to construct it it's not exactly that but we use it to construct this descent direction the descent direction has something to do with the smallest eigen direction of u and also singular the original direction. singular direction of uh, u and uh, the original descent direction okay uh, i have a question yeah so if there's a descent direction in the original parameter space yeah why does it, it does it have to be symmetric right it will be symmetric hmm? because u u transpose is a symmetric no but you're saying it's convex in the original x domain of x yeah which you haven't factored yeah so a rank one descent direction in just that. oh i i i mean uh, it's uh, there is a descent direction when you impose this psd constraint also right oh okay okay so the descent direction always moves in this psd cone okay so it will be a symmetric okay. uh, So uh, to summarize uh, the main point of uh, uh, the main reason that we started this work was the realization that low rank solutions to SDPs are very useful both from an application and algorithmic perspective. Excuse me, I'm not sure yeah. you're, I can see that your, uh, your, uh, your discussion here holds in, in exact arithmetic. But if you translate that to finite precision, then your, your statements about singular values and uh, going from Gaussians to Gaussian plus A for any A and statements about those singular values won't hold. Yeah, so, yeah. Because I can easily give you a matrix A where all the things that's totally numerically singular when you add it to a Gaussian and even on its own. So those arguments in finite precision are not going to hold anymore. No, that I am not sure. Yeah, I can, sure. Not if the Gaussian has high enough variance. No, I give you an A. But how you, you won't know what the I, I mean, you, I, ju I just, you know, make the A highly ill-conditioned. So regardless of what you add to it, it'll, it'll be highly ill-conditioned, numerically singular. No, no, if you add a random matrix, it will automatically have some small singular directions. Because you cannot account for... I, I already start with an adversarial AI. No, you don't know G. It's a huge ground. It's highly likely it's going to remain that way. No, no, no. No, for any AI. No, for any AI. Give me any A, I'll add Gaussians, and I can be sure... No, this just doesn't happen in practice. It doesn't The condition number will be N. This is a theory. Do ever do numerical computation. That doesn't happen. Let's let it continue. This is really good. Okay, so I'll maybe come to the probabilistic aspects later. So, uh, yeah, so the, uh, as I mentioned, low rank solutions, finding low rank solutions to semi definite programs is uh, very important both from an application and from an algorithmic perspective. And the Bureau Montero approach tries to leverage this idea. And we show that this actually does not work in the worst case, meaning that there are examples where it could get, in, uh, get stuck in like bad places. Uh, however, it does work in the smooth analysis sense and uh, we can get 
polynomial time convergence rates for this approach. Uh, and let me just present briefly uh, some open directions that I think are very interesting. So firstly, while this is the first result in giving polynomial time guarantees for the Bureau Montero approach, we believe that our results are not tight. And uh, uh, even more importantly, I think the uh, fact that we work with uh, penalty method uh, is not very satisfying because penalty method is not really used in practice and the algorithm that's actually used in practice is augmented Lagrangian methods and uh, extending these kind of results for uh, augmented Lagrangian methods uh, is very interesting. Uh, we have some preliminary results on exact ALMs but uh, uh, it will be very interesting to uh, understand the case for inexact ALMs. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, in machine learning, uh, we are usually also interested in uh, very specially structured problems where we are not satisfied with finding solutions of rank square root m but rather much much smaller rank. So extending these approaches for specially structured problems where you may be able to find much smaller rank solutions might be interesting. Uh, and there is one uh, direction that I really like which is basically a random matrix theory question and uh, the reason we were not able to solve this very well is also the reason for like suboptimality in our results. And uh, let me try to explain the problem, uh, which I think is very interesting. So if we uh, ask how close a random vector will be to a random subspace, uh, we are able to answer this, like this question is very well understood because uh, you just look at the orthogonal space and uh, how large, uh, how small the vector can be in this orthogonal space. Similarly, if you ask how close a random matrix can be from the set of all lower rank matrices, this boils down to understanding the smallest singular values of a random matrix. This has also been very well studied uh, in the recent past. Uh, the question that actually arises in our work is how close will a random matrix be to the sum of a subspace and the set of low rank matrices. Okay. So if you construct the set of A plus B where A comes from a subspace and B is a low rank matrix. Okay. So this is the Minkowski sum of a subspace and the set of low rank matrices how close can a random matrix be to this subspace and this is the like really key question that we try to ask uh, our solution depends on this epsilon net argument which i think gives pretty loose results and if uh, it is possible to get a much tighter uh, result for this question i think it will automatically improve our results and uh, to me, it seems like this is a very natural question and uh, very interesting one as well. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. So for your um, for your epsilon net question, right? Yeah. Um, is the difficulty compactness or boundedness or the subspace and uh, yeah. So if it is compact, you can definitely use epsilon net argument to get this. Yeah. But when you are looking at the subspace plus the set of low rank matrices, it's, it's right. unbounded. Yeah. So and uh, there is this way of getting epsilon nets where you peel off a piece and then half the. <coughs> we can talk about that. Yeah. But still, I, I feel it works only for compact, right? Maybe it gets a better dependence on Maybe. like the size of the set or something. But I would think it still works only for compact sets. Yeah. Um, so the the thing that prevents you from uh, extending this to where the, your objective was CX. Yeah. But it, 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 uh, like a more general convex FX, it uh, will not work because you don't have this previous result of the square root m exist, existence of a square root m solution. For, uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess my question is why does it not extend to a general FX subject to linear constraints? In so in our result, it does not extend because. Uh, Okay, so what exactly are we doing? So we have this G plus this matrix, right? So yeah. if you don't have this C, mm -hmm. then this thing can actually change from point to point. So you have to do your union bound or like uh, over some some other thing. So here C plus this is still a subspace, like this is still in a subspace. This is a fine subspace. But if C can vary from point to point, you have to account for all the different C's that can come from your function. Okay, so with that, let's thank the speaker and take the rest of the time. Thank you.